he has left the place. Okay. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Klein. And it's really uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and I am amazed um, to see what uh, you are doing uh, uh, with this. Uh, I think the it's, it's still a screen is there. Okay. So, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are a lot of questions. So I am uh, I, I try to uh, sort it out. Um, so there's a lot of repetition and um, kindly kind enough, Doctor. Edward Bell already answered a few of them. So starting okay. with the <laughs> so starting with the um, ventilation, as you know that there are uh, some uh, recent studies from 2018 by Dr. Ramanathan and uh, his group about uh, there is no difference if you use the high frequency ventilation and the uh, conventional ventilation. So, uh, is there any um, particular study you did in those babies that, or you just uh, start them on the high frequency ventilation? So, you know, we're a first intention um, center. And I think the, you know, we've gotten very comfortable and have a lot of uh, expertise in using a very low tidal volume approach. Um, we also, you know, it's, I, I don't, don't want to say it's unique to, for example, just the jet ventilator, because we also just participated in a large trial with uh, Dr. Martin Kessler of the Draeger mm -hmm. volume guaranteed high frequency, it's, which yeah. is available to the rest of the world, but not Iowa and not mm -hmm. United States, mm -hmm. and also had very high survival. No 22 weekers were allowed to be enrolled in that study, but very excellent outcomes using a low tidal volume strategy. So I don't think it's so much the exact high frequency device, but using the device in an appropriate way to minimize value trauma. Now, um, I tend to go, you know, with the original trial from Dr. Martin Kessler that was looking at um, the incidence of severe BPD back in the middle 90s, conventional versus the high versus high frequency. Um, a lot of these studies that say there's not a difference with high frequency, I'm not sure that they take the exact uh, correct approach because it's a management trial. And it's very difficult. Uh, it's different than a surfactant trial. For example, if I gave you surfactant, and now it seems pretty obvious that we're giving the surfactant through the ET tube. But if I gave people surfactant and people decided, well, I'm going to give it through the nasal gastric tube, and no one told them they have to give it in the lung, that they'd say, okay, surfactant doesn't work. So I, I feel a lot of the um, high frequency trials, and I'm not sure if they've always optimized the high frequency perfectly, but you know, I know Japan uses sort of an oscillatory approach for low tidal volume. I know some other centers use um, volume guarantee conventional. And, and I think, you know, I think the key is focusing on minimizing value trauma. And obviously my belief is using two per kilo rather than five per kilo is a better approach, but it's what works best for your unit. You know, if, if people are, are very precise with conventional ventilation, I, I'm sure the outcomes can be, you know, quite, quite good. But I, all I can just say is our survival and our outcomes are based on the high frequency approach. Sure, sure. So me and uh, Dr. Khalid, uh, who's the, one of the panelists uh, in the screen now, um, both of us are a great fan of the high frequency and we did a lot of workshop and we uh, are using, uh, and Khalid uh, uh, published his data. So Khalid, a, a comment uh, from you. Uh, regarding our published data about the high frequency, uh, we did a study regarding the complication or the uh, comparing the high frequency with the conventional ventilation on different organs. Uh, and we didn't find that the high frequency uh, caused uh, more IVH as it was uh, postulated, no, no uh, chronic lung disease. Uh, on the contrary, it, it was uh, treating the chronic lung disease. And uh, we did uh, something, it was uh, for the first time to, to examine the renal function and uh, renal uh, uh, levels uh, markers 
uh, with the high frequency babies, and we didn't find that the high frequency caused any problem with the with these uh, organs. Yeah, thank thank you, Khalid. Uh, uh, so, uh, Jonathan, there is a a lot of questions about fluid and electrolyte bal imbalance and balances. You mentioned about uh, sodium. You mentioned about uh, glucose. But there are people asking about hypo and hyperkalemia. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so, you know, the, the hyperkalemia is something that you, to me, is often a sign of acute kidney injury. And in the past, if people started on too little fluids, the kidneys would shut down and they get hyperkalemic very quickly and pass away. And even if you do humidification, so people that are when they say, oh, you're using 350 mLs per kilo, that's gonna be a problem. And I'm like, well, it's not a really a problem because the excess fluid evaporates off. Uh, the key thing is maintaining adequate intravascular volume and maintaining good renal perfusion pressure. So you have to, you, you can't assume that, that um, the initial fluid you choose is gonna be adequate. It's, you can't get behind. Once the kidneys shut down, you're way behind and the patient's probably gonna pass away due to the acute kidney injury. With the hyperkalemia. So we find that you need to give a lot of fluid and we really don't add K until we're actually having K potassium levels basically less than three. Then we start to slowly add potassium. I, th I think um, the, and it's interesting, it's not just, you know, some of these kids will actually have very high urine output and people, and a lot of times it's because the kidneys are just so immature that they still may have, you'd say, okay, that's a, we're chasing the urine output. You're actually not because they're sort of, if you don't keep up with the urine output, you're gonna get way behind. So it's, it's not just insensible losses that often occurs in this population, but their kidneys, the nephrons have not descended very deep into the medullary. So they really don't reabsorb sodium very effectively. So if you calculated the fractional excretion of sodium, it's 13%, it's 15%, it's 17%, and you have to sort of keep up with that. I comment also. Um, sure. We used to see this problem with hyperkalemia uh, years ago. Um, it's largely gone away with the universal use of antineedle uh, glucocorticoids and good early nutrition. I think that the hyperkalemia uh, was partly because of the um, sodium AT sodium potassium ATPase uh, problem that's been uh, averted with antineal glucocorticoids and also by the, the catabolism that we avoid with good early nutrition because uh, potassium is in, an intracellular ion and it was being discharged uh, as a byproduct of catabolism. So that's that's largely gone by the way. Uh, but as John said, we, we, don't, we don't usually uh, put it in we don't give it to the babies until we see it come down. The, that's the important thing. The advantage of actually having the ability to, to use a lot of fluid, mm -hmm. when we often have three fluids running in these babies and that keeps the lines open. Some lines might be at one or, one or two mLs per hour with, with three lines. And that allows us to give, like I talked about approximately 100 mLs per kilo per day of NVN so they can get adequate phosphorus intake, especially if you're an IUGR baby, you have sort of the starvation syndrome, you start making ATP quickly and you can drop your phosphorus. So there are a lot of centers that tell me they're having trouble maintaining normal phosphorus. And the whole reason is they're keeping their fluids so incredibly tight and they're, and they're using their NVN to control fluid balance. And we basically don't touch our NVN. We have three fluids running. We have a UAC fluid that has acetate in it at different concentrations depending upon the need. And we'll have a carrier fluid and that carrier fluid may often be as low as you know D two and a half or even D 1.5 W as a way to keep a free water loss so that we don't have to, as sodium changes, we don't have to manipulate the NVN. Um, the, the, again, once the skin is keratinized seven to 10 days, then obviously your fluid requirements start coming down because um, your sodium start to get lower. So obviously, and you don't need as much uh, free water. Okay. Um, again, these are, again, this is a unique population. Yeah. So uh, the other questions are about the amount of the fluid you are using because it's a very high 250 to 300. 
So what is the relation between that high fluid and the uh, PDA, uh, the ductus opening, and how you uh, treat them? What is your rate uh, of treating the PDA in your unit in these babies? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to address that. Sure. There's a misunderstanding that PDA is linked to high fluid intake. It's not so much the absolute intake, it's the relationship between the intake and the requirement. So if you have a high requirement, you need a high intake, but only if your intake exceeds your requirement by a significant amount does your risk of PDA go up. Okay. So we, yeah, yeah. go ahead. I was just saying, actually, that, that population at 22 to 24 weeks, only about half actually need the PDA intervened on with medical therapy and due to a hemodynamically significant shunt. It's interesting, a lot of these 22, 23 week babies, actually in the first couple of days, they have pulmonary hypertension. So the worst thing to do would be to allow the, the duct to close and have the RV fail. And then um, if we go long-term, how many actually need surgical intervention or cardiac calf closure? It's, it's only about 15 to 20%. So as, as Dr. Bell says, a lot of the times, if you underdo the fluid in this population, they're actually, if you get a, a hemodynamic echo, they're intravascularly volume depleted. Um, so, and even with humidity, there are people that don't start with enough fluid. So we don't start at 250 to 350, we would start at 150 and then we follow them closely. So one baby might start at 150 and may not need more than 200 or 250. Another baby might start at 150 and need 350 for 24 hours. Um, all of them, you know, that 350 might only be for 24 hours and they start to keratinize and the fluid requirements start to drop off more and more. And a lot of the fluid tends to be from the UAC because basically they just need more free water. But the UAC, like I said, might be, have 60 milliequivalents per liter of sodium acetate, for example. So giving, giving fluid without the dextrose. The trouble occurs if you're dependent upon giving dextrose fluid only, you get hyperglycemic and then things get very difficult. Can I so just ask you a question here? I'm Dr. Sridhar here. Uh, thank you for an excellent and eye-opening talk. Uh, the humidification part, I mean, it's a uh, new information in terms of, I mean, uh, in these babies specifically. So since when are you doing it? And I mean, how do we approach it? I mean, you do it for just 23 weekers and 22 weekers, or you do it for the... It, I mean, not doing humidification. Yeah. We, we don't, I'll let, Dr. Rod, you want to talk about our thermal therapy? <clears throat> yeah, we, uh, we, we are a little unusual in that we, um, preferentially keep these tiny babies, in fact, all of our sickest babies on radiant warmers uh, initially to, to make access easier so that we don't have to disturb the thermal environment when we're uh, performing procedures. Uh, for these tiny babies, we put them on a radiant warmer and then we use a thin barrier of uh, polyethylene food wrap stretched over the baby or placed on them as a blanket to provide a, a moist micro environment and uh, limit evaporative losses and also to limit uh, convective losses from air currents that are stirred up when people walk by. Uh, we don't pipe in additional humidity. Uh, it works well for us. It does, uh, they do have higher insensible losses than they would if they were in an incubator with added humidity. Uh, so we do have to give them more fluid, but that does make it easier for us to provide more nutrition. Uh, it doesn't increase the uh, risks of PDA uh, unless you uh, misjudge and overshoot uh, their fluid requirements by a significant amount. Uh, and it's worked well for us over the years. Uh, a lot of people are surprised when they hear that we manage babies that way, uh, but it's uh, it served us well. Uh, there are lots of places in the U.S. that keep these babies in incubators. <clears throat> they have to um, manage them with much less fluid intake, which limits what they can give them nutritionally, uh, makes their uh, management much more challenging in terms of how they deliver uh, fluids uh, or uh, drugs that are given by infusion. 
They have trouble uh, with calcium and phosphorus metabolism. Those centers. Yeah, yeah, or if, if they're on uh, drugs that are given by uh, by drips, um, it means you've got to be able to perform procedures through the portals. Or um, <clears throat> the we have lots. Of, we have uh, hybrid uh, devices now that uh, the giraffe device that enables you know put it up and use it as a radiant warmer or put it down and use it as an incubator and sometimes we use those and close them up between times but usually we keep them open uh, when the babies are young and we want to have ready access uh, it's just that it's just the way we've always done things here and uh, perhaps it's a bit unusual but it works well for us I mean, what about the labor are... room do you use a plastic bag in the labor room or? yes, yes. So they, I didn't. I didn't talk about. You know, we do in terms of resuscitation. They all have the the polyethylene bag. They all have polyethylene hats. So I don't think. And we try to have the DRs heated to 25 degrees Celsius. So I don't think there's anything unusual about our our resuscitation resuscitation approach to, to minimize hypothermia. And we also use what we call a transwarmer mattress. So we put them on that chemical mattress. Um, so they come back um, warm from the delivery room, and I think everyone I think everyone's trying to minimize hypothermia. So that's I don't think any of that's unique. So as Dr. Bell was saying, the one thing we also use is that we do put a saran wrap across the top of these radiant warmers to avoid convective heat loss as people walk by, or as the ventilation system's going. Plus, it helps to minimize a little bit of the radiant loss, so the babies aren't radiating their heat directly into the environment. Um, and again, there are centers that do humidification and still have these tiny babies die from acute kidney injury from intravascular volume depletion because they try they again start too little fluid. And once those kidneys get damaged, you it usually uh, portends babies not going to survive. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is you, you we want to stay ahead. Uh, we can't let intravascular volume depletion to occur. We can't allow the kidneys get poorly perfused. Um, we do follow, you know, we do get a lot of labs in the first couple days, um, which to me, that's where the, it's important. You need a lot of labs in the first couple days, you know, as weeks go by, oh, you don't need much labs at all. But I think people get two little labs the first couple days. So people trying to manage a 22 week or with only two gases a day, two sodiums a day, two glucoses a day, that's gonna fall apart. Even ones we can't get an art line in, we still will do a capillary uh, uh, test every six hours. If we have an art line, we'll obviously probably do it a little bit more frequently. But places that do a 22 week or twice a day do not have good survival or good neurologic outcome because the glucose comes back unexpectedly a couple hundred, the CO2 comes back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and it's just too late if spending 12 hours with a bad gas or a bad glucose or, a, or a too low, or too high, or too low sodium. So mm -hmm. what is your policy on the PDA? No? Because lately Patrick was saying that PDA need not be very aggressively treated and it should be taken as a medium way to in, in this small tiny babies we talk about. The PDA is need not be taken as a the whole pendulum has shifted towards do not treat 10 years back to conservative treating by Patrick McNamara in the last uh, Few years. I wanted to say, what do we do in uh, Iowa? You know, what do we do? Uh, um, okay, so I'll tell you what we do. So, in this, in the babies that were presented in the paper that was uh, published in, in 2020, which went through 2015, um, those babies, the PDA was not intervened on until seven days of life. But at that paper, because they weren't intervened on until, or even looked for a PDA until seven days of life, about 40 to 50% eventually needed some type of um, surgical intervention for PDA closure. Now with Dr. McNamara, we now do a targeted echo at 18 to 24 hours of life. That is to help assess, um, one, is there pulmonary hypertension and help validate the need for nitric oxide Two, it helps to look at right ventricular dysfunction in case these babies, a small percent of these babies need dobutamine as a general inotrope to help RV function. And it also helps to determine if the PDA is hemodynamically significant and you have a, a large shunt away from the mesenteric bed, 
then that be, that would be a patient that we would intervene with acetaminophen, um, you know, two, three day courses. So we don't do any prophylactic indomethacin. And he's got a whole, many of his papers have a scoring system for determining what's hemodynamically um, significant. So there will be a subset now that once they do show a shunt, then they'll be intervened on. And if the Tylenol does not work after a week, then we'll do indomethacin. And if that doesn't work after a few weeks, then they might be ligated or if they're large enough, get a piccolo device in the cath lab. Um, since, since doing that, like I said, instead of having almost 40% or more of these babies need to have a surgical intervention or cath intervention, it's down to more like 15 to 20%. So the idea is to be a little bit more precise. And just because a PDA is present doesn't mean it needs to be closed unless we show hemodynamic significance based on multiple variable measurements, obviously including size, but more importantly, the, the degree of the, of the shunt away from the, into the lungs and, and away from the gut. Um, Dr. McNamara could, sp could speak vastly better than I on uh, how to determine that. He's coming after a few months. Okay, okay. perfect. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, there are many questions about uh, the excavation protocol. And uh, the other thing is that, uh, as you know, in our region, we don't have high frequency <coughs> jet ventilator. We are using either the Draker high frequency with volume guarantee or the um, oscillator. Uh, as, as I said, that we are using um, as a uh, preference mode of the ventilation in those very small babies. But what about your excavation protocol? Uh, because this is very important. As you said, that you wait until they will feel that it is re ready. So what is the parameters, any guidelines you can suggest? Yeah, so that's... Um, so the, the first thing I think, you know, we're hoping to get access, you know, we finished, you know, a very long study with the Draeger Von Guaranteed High Frequency. You know, I think that's a excellent device. Our, our data is coming back extremely well. It's being presented to the FDA soon. And, you know, we showed many of those babies used 1.8 to 2.2 mLs per kilo. So obviously a low volume trauma device, usually at frequency of 10 hertz. Um, occasionally, there's some babies that lungs were so stiff you needed to actually use eight hertz, which allows you to deli deliver a bigger tidal volume because um, many times you can't achieve the volume guarantee um, if, unless, you, uh, unless you have enough time and inspiration which um, with the Draeger. Okay, so, and, and, or the high frequency oscillatory devices. I think, you know, all, you know, the whole key is minimizing volume trauma and whatever device the unit is most comfortable with, I think is fantastic. So what are we looking with with the jet? So for us, we want to, again, I'm talking about 22, 23 weekers. I'm not talking older babies. So we want to make sure that we've outgrown the period of having severe spells, that we're not having multiple desaturation events. You know, we don't want to have more than, you know, let's say we're talking usually like less than six to eight spells a day. Um, there are centers that tolerate multiple spells per hour, and we're just not in a rush to do that because they're going to fail from severe apnea. So we want them to outgrow spells. We want them to be vigorous and active. You know, I, I, the, the settings, it's hard for me to say because it depends on the device that you're on. So I can't give exact settings. It's more, you can sort of tell, I mean, we also want them on these 22, 23 weekers to be on full feeds not have any central lines in. So, and usually on, clearly on ideally less than 40 to 50% oxygen. And again, we're talking 22 weeks, 23 weeks. We're not talking 27, 28 or 26 weekers. Sure. And, and most of the time, you know, for us, since the device that we use, um, since we use Nava for the, these tiny babies, the company, the six French 49 centimeter um, Nava catheter is too long for babies under 800 grams. So we usually wait for the babies to be closer to 900 grams. Uh, if you try the Nava catheter at the proper position, the baby's too small, it can perf, actually will perf their stomach. Now, we certainly have IUGR 26 weekers that will get extubated not to Nava, but to nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. Um, so that's a different story. 
so I would say most of the 20 to 23 weekers on average, they're about a, a month to four, four to seven weeks. The spells are not an issue. The feeding, you know, is, is never, is not a problem. But what you don't want to do, if you, if you're extubating one of these babies, a 22, 23 weeker in the first two weeks of life, they probably are not on full feeds tolerating that well. They probably still have inspissated meconium. Now you're pumping all that gas in, then you get a perforation. And um, we really want to avoid intestinal perforations, whether they're due to prophylactic endomethacin, whether they're due to inspissated meconium leading to intestinal distension from non-invasive ventilation, whether they're due to necrotizing enterocolitis, it just has to be prevented because that's a, they're at huge risk at 22 and 23 weeks. So, um, and, and nothing really is, you know, nothing, if we're using these low tidal volume devices, whether it's Drager or the Jet or an oscillator, these babies, you know, can do very well because um, they're just not really ready to be off on their own. And again, we want to think of a 22, 23 weeker is not the same as a 27, 28 weeker. And that's the, and you have to kind of reconfigure everything, not based on chronological age, but on postmenstrual age. Think of a 22 weeker who's six weeks old in three days. That's a 28 week postmenstrual age baby. Compare yeah. that 28 and three seven week postmenstrual baby to a 28 weeker who's three days old. Then do the same thing. Okay. That's the main point I want people to get across with 22 weekers. Think about them in terms of postmenstrual age, not chronological or calendar age. Sure. Uh, uh, before I uh, ask uh, my colleague Khaled to have the, there's one question, not the one, but two, three questions about the caffeine use. So caffeine, uh, we are using caffeine uh, day one, right away, stabilize, and that's it. So you have the same practice? Yeah, so again, you know, stuff that I think is well proven, I really didn't, didn't talk about, but there was that brilliant work by Barbara Schmidt with numerous yeah. follow-up articles. It's just fantastic brilliance. And so uh, caffeine is, is built into our order sets, all babies under 1,250 grams. We give caffeine within the first 12 hours of birth. We try not to give it right at birth mm -hmm. because I've seen some babies go into SVT when the high dose is pushed in right at birth. So, and, and again, the 22, 23 weekers are basically all on the vent. They do get caffeine within, you know, 12 hours of birth. We leave them on caffeine for uh, a long time. We try to maximize it as much as possible. If, a, as long as the heart rate is, is not incredibly high and they're having central apnea, we do a lot of, um, we don't follow levels, but we'll give a lot of half loading doses of 10 milligrams per kilogram of caffeine citrate. Certainly, if the heart rates are now 180 to 200, then we're going to not continue, you know, not push it up. Um, at some point, if the babies are still on the ventilator past a month of age and they seem to be having CO2 retention as more of an issue, we might, rather than central apnea, we might transition to theophylline as a bronchodilator as well as an anti-inflammatory agent because theophylline has some work through the TOL4 receptor pathways. So sometimes we will switch to theophylline and some babies that are developing lung disease past a month of age. But no, we agree completely caffeine soon after birth, 100% in all this population. The other thing that we do, they, these po this population all gets vitamin A based on the NRN study to reduce uh, BPD. So we do do intramuscular vitamin A for the first 28 days of life, three doses a week. Um, the other thing that we do, this is work from Dr. Bell we do give our babies vitamin E. Um, Dr. Bell had some work showing that that may be also protective from IVH. So that's something that we've always done. We've not seen any harm with the dose that Dr. Bell's recommended. So we also do a dose of vitamin E. Um, that's uh, given um, through the nasal gastric tube. Yes, Khaled, over to you. Uh, uh, thanks, Junaid. Uh, Thank you, Jonathan Bell uh, for, and Bell for the uh, really encouraging results. Uh, and you gave us, uh, us a push, uh, but we should be cautious. Um, I want to ask about the umbilical venous catheter and the arterial catheter. For how long you will keep them? So again, this is sort of a slightly different approach. The, the umbilical artery catheter will try to keep actually 10 to 14 days 
we we're trying to once once we go to the capillary sticks i mean you know we want to get the skin keratinized and so if we you know can get an abilgar catheter the smallest we've ever used are the 2.8 french but usually we'll see if the 3.5 french will work um so we tend to keep that you know probably the longest on the most part is 14 days there may have been some slightly longer but on average most come out 10 to 14 days the umbilical venous catheters actually don't stay as long sometimes they you know, they will get in the right position. Sometimes they're not in the right <clears throat> position. Sometimes they slide down. And so usually we try to convert from an umbilical venous catheter to a percutaneous central line. Um, you know, the 28 gauge, usually between seven and 14 days. So ideally by 14 days, the, the umbilical lines should be out. Again, this is a 22 week population and they should have a, um, a um, percutaneous central line. Obviously, there are, there's, always been ex there's always an exception. Yeah, because uh, with this very fragile skin, do you think the percutaneous line will be uh, easily uh, uh, inserted? Yeah, yeah so it, 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 it's, a, it's a challenge. And so there are babies that are, we have fantastic neonatal nurse practitioners that are, you know, we've had babies that um, that could not get any, even a low umbilical venous line. And they have some that they were able to place a percutaneous central line. And you could actually see it because of the gelatinous skin and it would work. But normally, if we can get that umbilical venous line, even a low line, temporarily, we try to wait a couple of days. Let's say we have a low line, we'll wait a couple of days to get at least some characterization of the skin before placing that pick line. The, um, and because we don't need, because we don't push the dextrose really high, because we can give a lot of fluids, we don't need to have a high osmolar concentrated of dextrose. So, and our NVN often is just D5 or even less initially. Um, once the skin is keratinized, if that's a low UVC, they might, like I said, put a pick line in it in the first couple of days of life. But if the UVC goes well, we probably won't replace that till about um, more like 10 days of life. Uh uh, do you advise the uh, prophylactic or the uh, therapeutic uh, uh, antifungal uh, measures? Okay, so that's an, another something that we've started. So we've always, um, the babies that are on antibiotics, we always do oral nystatin. There was a great paper from, um, I can't remember the authors, but it was from Turkey, where they kind of did a randomized control trial of prophylaxis with nystatin versus fluconazole. So we use our routine management is oral nystatin when we're on antibiotics. <clears throat> but in the last couple of years, as we've increased the number of these 22 weekers, um, we noticed we had two one year dye of fungal sepsis. And we've decided that until the skin is keratinized, um, because of that skin being vulnerable, because one of them, we actually found the fungal growth externally at the site of the pick line, that um, we've started all of them on two weeks of prophylactic fluconazole. So we don't do the six, I know this, the, the study was six weeks. Mm -hmm. And what was nice is that randomized control trial of six weeks of fluconazole did show a reduction in invasive candidiasis. Mm -hmm. So that was scientifically proven that it does reduce invasive candidiasis, which we think is a major problem at 22 and 23 weeks if they get it. So, so our Fungal is double coverage, oral nystatin, whether on antibiotics, and, in, and fluconazole, prophylactic dosing from birth to 14 days of life in all 22 and 23 weekers. And if the skin is keratinized by two weeks, we'll stop it. If the skin still looks questionable, we might go a little bit longer. So both those, the 22-week twin girls were on two weeks of the of fluconazole. Thank you very much. Uh... I think uh, I'm done, Janet, anything okay. else? Yeah, um, Jonathan, there is a few questions about the hypertension in those babies. Uh, how frequent you uh, uh, have this problem in these babies of hypertension and how, if they have, what is your, uh, you know, target number? Uh, like uh, mean gestational age, you are using it or something and how you treat it if you uh, want to treat it? So, um, so, and, and so we're basically talking about kind of the more of a isolated hypotension, sort of physiologic hypotension or prematurity, not the septic shock babies. So, 
Yeah, because you know, we, we tend to use the the old the old thing that came out of the epipage study that you know we want by three hours of life at least have the mean blood pressure above the gestational age within three hours of life. So a 22 weeker, we're looking for a mean of 22. Mm -hmm. However, if they have a large hemodynamic significant duct, then we're looking at a systolic that should be 10 to 12 above the mean, which would be low 30s. Um, the approach in those babies is a little bit of slow volume to make sure you're not intravascular volume depleted. And those are the babies that would start on this stress dose hydrocortisone and hopefully be weaned off with it pretty, pretty quickly within a few days. Um, you know, obviously babies in septic shock, it's a whole different story. And, and obviously we would, you know, uh, probably look at our, you know, um, you know, if the problem is a rising lactic acidosis. So a lot of the twin twin transfusions have sort of a cardiomyopathy with poor right ventricular function and LV function. So they'll get put on uh, dobutamine like five mics per kilo per minute. And that might be titrated up to 10 mics per kilo per minute. So those, so usually dobutamine is kind of dobutamine and some hydrocortisone and some fluid would be our mainline drugs and then fine tune eventually with the hemodynamics echo. Uh, um, and then the, it's always fascinating the stress dose hydrocortisone, something the Japanese also use that a lot. And um, the key is, you know, trying to come off it pretty quickly and not to give indomethacin at the same time. We know Indomethacin plus hydrocortisone doubles the risk of a spontaneous birth. We know indomethacin, yeah. So we, so we like to be off the hydrocortisone for a few days before we'd even give the indomethacin. Um, so just just that old, you know, that old fashioned number of the gestational age. Uh, so we don't shoot for 30, 22 weeks, we shoot for 22. And we know we don't, we take a couple hours. We don't stress about it right away. And the hydrocortisone, will kick in within three hours. And we don't worry about, you know, if someone wants to do an ACTH stem trial, they can, we tend not to. We just go ahead and, and start it and then wean it pretty quickly, uh, pretty rapidly. But we do use a lot of dobutamine if the problem on x-ray, like you have a rising lactate and you're, you have some cardiomegalia. And if you're able to get an echo, that's hemodynamics echo that shows RV dysfunction, and the dobutamine obviously helps with that. So we've, we, we rarely use dopamine um, anymore. Now, if we're talking about septic shock, that's a whole, again, a whole different story. Yeah, sure, that's a different question. Okay, so the last question from my side is the use of postnatal steroids in those babies. Okay, <laughs> um, good, okay. So we have kind of, um, two main approaches. Um, if, we're, if the baby is within, let's say it's a 24-weeker, not a 22-weeker, 24-weeker, we're a couple weeks old, we were part of a study of a 10-day course of hydrocortisone that was done by the Neonatal Research Network, uh, worked by Christy Waterberg using this sort of a 10-day titration to improve extubation. Hopefully the results of that study will come out soon. Dr. Bell probably knows better than me when the results of that study will come out but we will do kind of a 10 day hydrocortisone taper to prep some uh, a, kind of a, a baby who's on less than 50% oxygen, but doing pretty well um, for extubation. <clears throat> if it's a baby who is now three, four weeks old, five weeks old and doing very poorly, very inflammatory lung disease, not because we don't let anyone get hyperinflated. We try to avoid mechanical injury. You don't want to have those horribly hyperinflated cystic lungs. So they have more of a, general inflammatory picture, but they're now requiring 50, 60, 70% oxygen. We tend to do the work by Dr. Beverly Brzezinski from the 90s where she did a pulse, dex, pulse dexamethasone. This, um, it's a three-day burst. Um, and we try to use that when we either one to get the FiO2 back under 50% or as part of um, improving the lung for an extubation trial. And in her study, they always waited seven days minimum before repeating it. Now they kept giving in that study um, every seven to 10 days until the babies were extubated. We won't, if we give it, it's mainly because the lungs are so bad and we wanted to get the inflammation under control and get the oxygen from 70 to 100% back down to 50-ish percent. Then we give it and we wouldn't give it again until we got close to extubation. So we try not to give more than two or three of those pulses. Um, 
we've we've tried to um, you know some of the we try not to do too much of the dart protocol because it seems the dart protocol ends up being 10 days, then another 10 days, another 10 days, another 10 days, and we end up similar to the old 1980s 42 day steroid course. So we try to do targeted pulse decks based on Dr. Brzezinski's work. Okay. So uh, that's all uh, from my side and thank you very much. Um, uh, I wish I can share a picture of uh, our baby survival, which is 22 weaker and 480 grams. I sent it to Rajiv. Uh, without any complication, this is uh, and we, are doing, we, we are doing the same sort of the work that what you are doing, Jonathan and uh, Dr. Edward Bell, that uh, we are cohorting and try to have this, uh, uh, these uh, babies with the uh, very experienced oh, nurses. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so me. this is, yeah, this is yeah. The me and this is <laughs> the baby. Anyway, uh, over to you, Rajiv, and thanks a lot, uh, Jonathan and uh, Dr. Edward Bell. This is a very uh, comprehensive review of those babies. Uh, over to you, uh, Rajiv. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I have the next step? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bell, after I trained with you, I went and saved one 22-week, uh, 500 grand baby. In 1997, after my training with you, then I had to stay in the NIC for almost three months. I followed this baby up to 10 years, and now he has gone to school and he's not the brilliant, most brilliant kid, but he's just passing his grades. So I did a complete follow up. This is after my training with you in 1997. So I think Karvendan has to ask a few questions. Over to Karvendan. Uh, Taufik, just move the thing to Karvendan. He's audible. Yeah. Professors, yeah, we were just uh, discussing about giving lower lipids. Do you have a triglyceride threshold or anything? How, how do we decide how much? Yeah, so um, so we don't measure triglycerides. And we, saw, we show that if we, you know, we start low, we might start at half a gram per kilo, next day one gram per kilo, next day one and a half grams. And then if you're not hyperglycemic, then we try to work our way between one and a half and two and stay there. So occasionally the lab might let us know there's uh, lipemia, but we don't follow the triglycerides. I'll let Dr. Dr. Bell, I don't know if he wants to speak about the lipids or. Yeah, we'll as long as you, uh, as long as you keep your dose uh, at uh, two, two grams per kilogram per day over 20 hours, um, your infusion rate's never going to be more than 100 milligrams per kilogram per hour. You don't need to monitor triglycerides, and that's also going that's also going to give you enough lipid uh, to prevent essential fatty acid deficiency and enough to grow. Yeah. What other so lipids we use? I mean, we, we use fish oil based or so. Um, so the omega van, we we use a combination of omega van intralipids. Usually, we get referred patients many times with short gut syndrome that have developed. Uh, hyperbilirubinemia from uh, total parental nutrition and um, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia from the damage to the bile ducts. And so those will get basically 0.9 grams per kilo of omega van and 0.9 grams per kilo of intralipids. So that is found to be our protective strategy, but we don't because omega van, you have to give so much of it to actually get um, adequate essential fatty acids. We don't use that routinely. We just use it on a subset of patients. And I know some centers in the US and probably worldwide use SMOF and we're just not yet convinced of the SMOF data. So we feel our approach, we you know, um, kind of working to two grams per kilo of lipids, four grams per kilo of protein. Um, and we know looking at our growth outcomes at discharge, the babies are very well grown. So we don't really have any growth failure with that approach. I think. A lot of centers trying to push lipids up to three grams per kilo, I just think uh, just have more complications. And again, that's not something that, that, that we do. So Dr. Bell, that was a very comprehensive tutorial, which will last in our, I think for next one year. Maybe I have to come back for retraining and rethinking my philosophy after 23 years. But it's a fantastic presentation from all the reviews which came in. And now I ask Dr. Karavandan to, to give the vote of thanks. The, the younger generation will take over from us. 
I have just one comment before we close. I mean, uh, obviously, I mean, the number of questions uh, answered by Professor Bell shows the dedication he has to teaching. So hats off to you, sir. And obviously, uh, there are still many more questions to be addressed, but obviously, we have uh, run out of time. And uh, I mean, both of you have been very patient and guided us through. Thank you very much. And the out of the box thinking, uh, the humidification or the restricting the fat level, giving the full protein load from the beginning, all these are points we all need to learn. I mean, whether we adapt it the same way or we fine tune it. The most important part is what you started with. The teamwork, the amount of uh, babies, the number of babies you get. I mean, we always make errors where we're not two babies, we then improve on the next baby. But in a unit who gets one baby per year, the error we make can be fatal. So we really need to treat such babies in centers like yours to get the outcome. Unfortunately, the parents read on the internet that 80% survival at 22, 23 weeks, and they come back and put us on the spot. So, but uh, we need uh, to have centers regionalized. I mean, Dr. Kali this year, Dr. Junay this year. So we need the big centers to really take over such babies. Hopefully that experience will accumulate with time. So appreciate uh, your contribution. It has been a great evening. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. So, Karvandan, can you please propose the youngest? Will propose. Ah, good things, <laughs> doctor. Sorry, uh, before Dr. Karvandan gives the vote of thanks, just a few things about the CME. So, this program is accredited with CME from uh, MOH for two points. So, inshallah, like after the program, like you will receive a uh, link for the uh, MCQs. So, please answer those things in order to. I acquire your certificate, inshallah. So, and what, what is the passing that? rate of that MCQs? Uh, <laughs> 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 so, Dr. Raju uh, will be there as well. <laughs> miss you out. Thank you so much for your excellent work. I'm sure Karvin then will mention that. Yes. Okay. I just want to say one of the, I know there are a lot of questions about high frequency ventilation and if people just Google um, Iowa neonatology handbook, then go to the pulmonary section. I talk about the extremely premature babies. And I also talk about using the oscillator. Um, I haven't put anything about, I do have guidelines for using the Drager too in this population, but I haven't put them on there yet because I didn't want to get in trouble with the United States government and the FDA. So I have to wait for that. Um, but that is a, that it gives some approach. The, I just want to, um, the approach for the, with the jet, the rates are going to be much lower because the jet has a fixed eye time, which is very different than the oscillator and the Drager, where the eye time is a percent of the frequency, in which case those babies, you're going to use a higher frequency rather than a, a lower frequency. So you have to just, you have to understand how the, um, I time is set, whether it's fixed I time in milliseconds, like the jet where you can fix it at 20 milliseconds, or like the Drager where it's a IE ratio, so it's a percent. So it's a slightly different approach. So just, just, um, but so you can see some of that, but I'm hoping the FDA will approve. I think the, the Dra volume guaranteed Drager is a very good approach. I will tell you, we did use, with the 23 weekers, we used uh, 10 Hertz on those babies with a, a one to three, uh, IE ratio, but if they developed any PIE, we did do one to four, which I know that the device can do. Over to Carmen then. Thank you. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to, to talk to everyone all over the world. And it's very exciting seeing that, that 22 weekers that we can, we all can do this worldwide with being, just takes a little obsessive compulsive behavior at the bedside. Thank you. All good things come to an end. Like, likewise, this game is also coming to an end. On behalf of uh, the neonatal unit at NMC Specialty Hospital Dubai, I'm here by proposing the word of thanks. So thank you, Professor Edward Bell, for just taking us through the tiny baby registry. To borrow one of uh, Professor Bell's quotes, when <laughs> Professor Klein took us through the Iowa way of caring for very variable babies. He made a, our eyes grow wider and heart beat faster with excitement, not in fear. Thank you, Professor. I, I thank the moderators, 
Dr. Khalid Al Atavi and uh, Dr. Zunaid Khan for for your kind participation, and uh, I thank uh, Dr. Ramesh Kumar, IOP President, and uh, Dr. Sunny Korean, IOP Emirates, and Dr. Sridhar Kalyan Sundaram, and not least Dr. Rajiv, the brain and the force who made all this possible, who got the professors from the states who never visited Dubai, but we could hear all of them today because of him. Thank you, sir. And last, I thank uh, Tawfiq Ali. Without his uh, support, it wouldn't have been possible. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Ned. So using this respiratory approach, what are kind of our long-term outcomes? Um, so this is a, a, a brilliant paper. Here's Dr. Bell, uh, you know, this is the, uh, the Iowa team. And this is looking at outcomes at 18 to 22 months of corrected age. So many of these babies chronologically were 24 to 26 months. At and these are babies born at 22 to 25 weeks. But let's just look at the 22 and 23 weekers in this paper. And this was in Journal of Pediatrics. Um, there were 70 extremely premature infants at 22 to 23 weeks in this cohort. And obviously in order to see them after a couple of years of life, we had to you know, go back in time. And we treated them all with first intention high frequency. This was long enough ago that infant star still existed. That was another high frequency ventilator. Again, the concept is minimizing value trauma. And the majority were on the, the jet ventilator, again, with the concept to minimize value trauma. The survival in this cohort was quite amazing at that time. And that's why you don't want to be, always be fooled by smaller numbers, 70% at 22, 82% at 23. These have since, as we've increased the cohort, they've come down a little bit because Iowa now is becoming a referral center for the whole state. So many times they're getting sent to us, uh, women who've ruptured their membranes before 20 weeks. Um, so they potentially have a very high risk of severe pulmonary hypoplasia. So as we're getting more, the survival has come down a little bit. So it, right now it's 63% um, at 22 weeks, still incredibly high. Uh, obviously they all got surfactant. The other fascinating thing is that our 22 weekers are initially intubated with a 2 et tube, 93% of the 22 weekers. And we did 41% of the 23 weekers with a 2 et tube. Um, this is important because we know the most narrow part of the trachea is subglottic. And so what often happens if you're trying to force a 2-5 into a 22-weeker, the team's like, I can see it. I don't know why it's going in. I don't know why it's not going in. I think I'm at the cords. And the whole reason is, you know, a millimeter below the cords, it's reading, it's meeting obstruction because that's the narrowest point, which is why chronically intubated babies are at risk of subglottic stenosis and need for tracheostomy. So we'll start with the 2-OET tube. Um, as, uh, after a certain number of weeks, um, we will eventually transition to a 2.5 tube once they're bigger, usually around 550, 600 grams, we think about it. And the jet ventilator has had zero problems for us ventilating through that 202. Now, the median duration of ventilation uh, for this population is 63 days. So basically, um, we know that um, within nine weeks, half of these babies are actually off the ventilator. At, and if you th again, think about it as postmenstrual age. So the postmenstrual age they're coming off is between, is basically at 63 days is 31 weeks. So 31 weeks postmenstrual age, half of these babies are now um, off the ventilator. Now, what I consider severe BPD is you want to you know, go with Eric Jensen at, uh, at University of Pennsylvania, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, their brilliant work on what, what is the real BPD and that's this grading system. And grade three BPD means you're still on an invasive ventilator 36 weeks postmenstrual age. And if you're still on a ventilator 36 weeks postmenstrual age, this increases the risk of poor neurodevelopment outcome. So this is really the big marker, not oxygen at 36 weeks. And only 6% of this incredibly tiny group is still needing the ventilator. 
and only one required a tracheostomy in this group. Okay, so that's that's pulmonary. Let's talk. Let's talk about some differences with um, NVN or TPN. So total parental nutrition, neonatal neonatal venous nutrition strategies. We believe it's critically important to minimize hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia. So we're trying to keep glucoses 50 to 150. Um, we don't want them to get overly dry and get acute kidney injuries. So we're trying to keep the sodiums less than 150, but we don't want to overly hydrate them and keep them above 135. So do this at 22 weeks. We're talking about gelatinous skin here with very high insensible losses. It requires frequent labs. Now, here's the thing that, that's controversial. You know, we use fluids often up to 350 mLs per kilo per day in the first couple of days. The reason is we don't do humidification. We don't do humidification because we're trying to accelerate the keratin keratinization and minimize the risk of fungal sepsis. The advantage of being on all this fluid is that we can have everyone basically on 100 mLs per kilo per day of total parental nutrition, so they all can get four grams per kilo of protein. They can get their, full, their necessary calcium and phosphorus loads so they don't get hypophosphatemic. So we need to follow this closely. The other key thing is they don't need that much carbohydrates initially. You really wanna keep your GAR when you start roughly four milligrams per kilo per minute or less so you don't get hyperglycemic. Once you get hyperglycemic and you're starting to have to worry about insulin drips, things get very complicated and tend not to do very well at all. We also buffer with a lot of acetate to compensate for proximal renal tubular acidosis. So we don't have to overly ventilate aggressively to keep the pH above 725. Now, this low GAR um, stresses a lot of people out because it often takes a week before you can get up to much more than 50 to 60 calories per kilo. But the issue is that these babies aren't consuming that glucose so you don't want them to sit hyperglycemic. And they're basically, you're heating them, they're not moving much, and you're ventilating them fully. So the need for those higher calories comes about in second week of life, third week of life, fourth week of life. So as they get older, we will get up to the classic neonatal venous nutrition of 100 calories per kilo. But if you try to give that within a day or two of birth at a 22 weeker, they're gonna get hyperglycemic, and end up with hyperglycemia is associated with sepsis, associated with IVH, associated with severe ROP and increased mortality. Some of the babies that we've seen uh, pass away have all gotten hyperglycemia because people did not pay attention. Even, even, with, even when you try to standardize things, some people just don't pay attention and they get into trouble. Another thing is that you don't wanna push intralipids right away. And you certainly don't want to start them before 12 hours life. And you don't want to start high dose. You know, we start at a half to a gram per kilo per day in this, and not at birth, but the next day. And we never exceed two grams per kilo because we want a liver protector strategy. We don't want to develop NVN cholestasis or TPN cholestasis. But more importantly, there's a great paper here by Dr. Sosinko back from 1993. And they did a study feeling if we gave babies one and a half grams per kilo of lipids, we would save their lives because we'd be increasing antioxidants. And actually they found it was the opposite. The increased, death increased significantly in babies from 600 to 800 grams receiving intralipids. The death rate went up from 24 to 48%, so it doubled. So one and a half grams per kilo of lipids in the first 12 hours of life increased mortality from pulmonary hemorrhage. So you have to be very careful about initiating the lipids and taking your time and not pushing hard. The babies aren't gonna need this. Again, we're talking 22, 23 weekers. Now the opposite is protein is good. And so our goal is to get up to between three and a half and four grams per kilo per day of protein. Uh, we can't do that at birth. We, we have what we call our starter NVN, which is pre-made NVN. That NVN is, is, is to give them one and a half grams per kilo of protein at birth. And then the next day we'll the new NVN will work it up you know, pretty quickly to three and a half to four grams per kilo. Um, this is, has to be done because you just don't know how, exactly how much fluid you need in the beginning and we don't wanna waste a lot of um, NVN. The other thing that we do that's unique is there's this great work here by Shessex, 
that showed that if you shield your parental nutrition from light, improved survival rate in premature infants. And he actually did a lot of primary work plus the meta-analysis. So our NVN is photoprotected from creation, from transport, and in our tiny babies, until we get to the UVC or the PIC line, they have opaque tubing. And the rooms, individual rooms are light controlled, so the, there's never really very intense light ever on that NVN. So it's hard for me to say, you know, what percent is due to this or that, but these are all practices um, that we do. Now, um, I'm actually not talking about feeding on this. I will briefly say that we do try to use mom's breast milk as uh, number one. If we are unable to achieve that, then we do have a donor breast milk bank. We will start trophic feeds within the first uh, 24 to 48 hours of life. Trophic meaning 10 cc's per kilo, very little. We will take our time. We'll go very slowly. We pay attention to residuals. There's a lot of problems with meconium related intestinal injury. So we'll use some glycerin suppositories to try to get the meconium out. Um, we often, these babies, uh, often will take a few weeks to advance, to get up to full feeds. We don't try to push it in this population. Um, we also don't rush to add the fortification until after, after at least seven to 10 days so that we don't increase a big osmotic load until the baby's ready. So uh, some other differences in management strategies. Um, we've published a couple papers on thyroid screening at one month of age. We found that about 10 to 15% of these babies do have abnormal thyroid functions, not on the initial screen, but actually by a month of age, it's, it shows up. So a small percentage of these babies do go on thyroid replacement. They usually are on it for about, uh, up about until they're three years old, which time they're almost all able to be weaned off by endocrinology. Another thing is we don't use prophylactic hydrocortisone, but there are babies that we will use physiologic hydrocortisone, initially stress dose for blood pressure instability that is not related to septic shock, that these are low blood pressure values. And these babies might be on four to seven days of hydrocortisone. Most of them are able to wean off in the first week, but a subsection, again, about 10 to 15%. Every time you wean off the hydrocortisone, they end up having low blood pressure, start to fall, about, fall, fall apart in terms of the carter pulmonary status. So in those cases, we leave them on physiologic and let them outgrow it during the hospital stay. Another subset of babies um, have cardiopulmonary failure and they have to be rescued with inhaled NO. We know the multi-center randomized control trials showed that inhaled NO did not significantly reduce the incidence of BPD. However, if these babies have pulmonary hypoplasia due to preterm prolonged rupture of membranes and or pulmonary hypertension, Many of them, the only reason they can survive is that NO was used to treat their pulmonary hypertension. And um, usually these are babies that after surfactant, after appropriate lung management, they're still requiring more than 60 to 70% oxygen. And often you have echocardiographic evidence of the pulmonary hypertension. They're placed on NO and very soon they often are down to less than 30% oxygen. Um, other things that we've been doing we do do probiotics uh, since 2014. We do do delayed cord clamping now since 2014. In terms of nerve development outcomes, which I'll talk about, we do use aggressive phototherapy. This is from the New England trial in 2008 with the goal of improving nerve development outcomes. And we, with Dr. Mac, Patrick McNamara becoming our division head since the last two years, we now have a targeted neonatal hemodynamic echocardiography service. So we now will look in the first week of life for hemodynamic and significant shunts. And in this population, we don't do prophylactic endomethacin. In the first week, we actually will use acetaminophen for treating a hemodynamic and significant shunt. The second week of life, if the shunt is still an issue and they're not on steroids, they will get into sin. Um, this, I show this because this is an interesting phenomenon. This is, again, a twin. The other twin uh, died soon after birth. Another 22 and once on the week twin 
IUGR for 22 weeks during 94 grams. And unfortunately, there's a population of severe IUGR babies that die from hepatoblastoma at about age two to three. So this was uh, sad. She made it home, but uh, died of hepatoblastoma. Okay, so let's go back to the 22 weekers. If I asked you, what do you think the cause of death is? So this is sort of, a, again, a thought question. Um, and under, under infection, all will include, you know, I, I put necrotizing enterocolitis within the infection category here. So would you think, are most of these babies dying from IVH? Are they dying from respiratory failure? Are they dying from birth trauma or asphyxia or infection? And just think to yourself, what do you think is the main issue of uh, the death of this population? And the main issue is infection. And this is why I brought up those stories of babies being saved because of early diagnosis of subtle signs of infection. We all can diagnose septic shock when we don't have a blood pressure and the baby's amazingly tachycardic and not oxygenating, not ventilating, and poorly perfused. It's too late then. Uh, cytokine release and it's over. So you have to be very hypervigilant. And now the problem is there is a large part of this, which is early onset sepsis. And so unfortunately, there's a large portion of these babies that are gonna die no matter what we're doing because they come in, mom has severe choreo and the babies are overwhelmingly affected and they often die within the first day or two of life. But again, our approach is a trial of life. If the parents wish us to, we'll do a trial of life and many of these babies end up do surviving. Now, with the trial of life, if a baby here, as you can see, 31% did die of IVH, most of these support was withdrawn. If the baby has a severe grade four IVH and the parents want to redirect care to palliative care. We have no issue with that. Um, but a lot of times you just don't know that until that happens. Um, respiratory failure is very minimal because again, I feel one of the keys is uh, minimizing value trauma approach. This is a hard one to fix, the perinatal asphyxia, because this would require crash C-sections for fetal distress, and we don't want to be doing that in this, this population. Okay, so how about some other morbidities? And, um, and again, as I'm showing you, I'm showing you, you know, again, lots of twins. Um, this is 22 week and three seven week twin, 544 grams. His twin died um, from uh, infection related, basically necrotizing enterocolitis. And these are 23 week twins that are both alive and the 22 week twins I showed before. So what if we look at the other morbidities that we're trying to prevent? Well, we know severe IVH, we wanna minimize as much as possible. And the key thing, the literature would imply that until re more recent data out of Iowa, that it's 100% morbidity. And that's just not true. Severe IVH grade three, four was 25%. Um, there are many places that have a 25% severe IVH, IVH rate in 24 and 25 weekers, not 22 and 23. PVL was 6%. Neck is a, is a problem, which is why I talked about the feeds. You have to pay a lot of attention to that. 14% incidence and need for laser therapy was 12%. The 23 weeks, the IV, severe IVH rate drops in our approach, 18%. PVL is about the same. Neck drops, but it's still an issue, 10%. But we have the ROP pretty well figured out at 23 weeks. Only 2% of the 23 weekers needed laser uh, therapy. So we would say extreme prematurity is not, is not hopeless, that you're not guaranteeing 100% morbidity with these approaches. Um, this is some data, again, reinforcing that these are, the 22-weekers are not LGA babies. They're basically all AGA, the 10th and 90th percentile. We're right here at 486 grams. And there's the 23-weekers AGA and the 24-weekers AGA. And the median gestations are all right where they should be. Um, this is a 23-weeker who had fungal sepsis and did have six weeks of amphotericin and is now uh, a student in high school. <clears throat> Some other points is that obviously no one wants these babies to be born premature. So we know if you're looking at babies between 22 and 24 weeks, obviously it's better to be 
more mature at 24 weeks. It's better to be larger at, at 22 to 24 weeks to improve survival. As Dr. Bell stated, it's not good to be a male, extremely premature baby. Uh, male is a high risk of mortality. Antenatal steroids are pretty important. They're again, like we talked about associating with survival. We know severe IVH is often one of the causes for withdrawal of support. So we want to try to minimize that as much as possible. And interestingly, older moms, I, I don't know why, but that was protective um, in terms of mortality. Again, I just want to talk about being at 22 to 23 weeks. You have to be on the ventilator longer than expected. Um, the median time, you know, here, this would be eight weeks. So that would be about, you know, 30 weeks postmenstrual age. But again, the goal is to get them up to 900,000 grams, not having them fail. And again, this median, so that means half these babies actually were extubated before um, 30 weeks postmenstrual age. And again, at 22 to 23 weeks, neck is a problem. Meconium related intestinal injury is a problem. Both Japan and Cologne, Germany, and us are always working hard to try to how to get this inspissated meconium to move on and have a nice controlled approach. We're doing a combination of glycerin suppositories, and we will do sort of the second week of life if things aren't progressing. And rather than push to the point of perforation and neck, we will do a, up in the NICU, we will do a contrast, lower gastrointestinal study, contrast enema, basically to remove the inspissated meconium. And it actually moves the inspissated meconium, not just from the colon, but the ileocecal valve in these babies is really not that secure. So it actually helps because that it will go up into the small reflex up into the small bowel and get all that inspissated meconium out. As you can see, the surgical neck drops uh, basically fivefold by 24 to 25 weeks. So this is a high risk and you've got to very gently advance the feeds and pay a lot of attention. Okay, next important thing is neurodevelopmental outcome. You know, we just don't want to save babies if they're neurologically devastated. We want them to thrive and be a neurologically intact baby. So what is the rate of severe disability? Another thought experiment at 18 to 22 months using these definitions, Bailey score less than 70, or severe cerebral palsy, or blindness, or deafness. For infants born at this period of time, 06 to 2015, at 22 to 23 weeks at the University of Iowa. And again, it's a, another thought experiment to try to think where, where do we think um, the mortality not mortality, I'm sorry, but severe disability. Clearly it's not 100% because I don't have that choice on here as the literature would imply. And it's just 11%. So I think if you take a very neuroprotective approach um, that you can have good survival and as well as good neurodevelopmental outcomes. So this is again from the, the paper that Dr. Bell had published in Journal of Pediatrics in, in 2020. And if we work our way, and that was, that was all 22 and 23 weekers, but let's just look at the 22 weekers. And again, the number is small, um, but the, the, data is, the data are the data. So we follow these babies down along the 22 week pathway, severe neurodevelopmental impairment in this population, again, granted small numbers was not 100%, it was only 18%. And more importantly, no or mild was over 55%. And if you combine moderate with that, it's almost 80%. And as time goes by, many of the moderates shift into the no or mild. At 23 weeks, you can see no or mild, you know, basically a 68%. And again, only 9% severe. And at 24 weeks, this is now up to 79% no or mild. So I think you can have a pretty excellent neurodevelopmental outcome with these, uh, some of these approaches. Uh, some other things to, to look at, if we look at some other long-term outcomes at about two years of age, you know, we did not have anyone still on a ventilator. There was one baby still trached for airway issues, but not needing the ventilator. 17% um, still needed some supplemental oxygen. We know avelarization continues up to age eight. So as time goes by, more and more of these babies do come off their oxygen, but 100% are not on oxygen. 8% um, had G-tubes, so the vast majority did not have feeding failure. 
Um, autism was 0% in this group. Um, now, since this study, I do know one of the 22 weekers that I found clinic does have autism. Cerebral palsy was about 18% in the 22 to 23 weekers and again, uh, need for a VP shunt. So severe enough post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, that was 7%. Uh, so in conclusion, I, I would say survival is extremely difficult. I don't think it's impossible. I don't think it's hopeless. You know, I remember when this baby was born, this was a 22 and two son weaker. Again, uh, this would be SGA. 335 grams. This mom was on methamphetamine. So it, this isn't, you know, this is not a great social situation or in utero environment. I would think this is impossible with this degree of gelatinous uh, patient. Um, this is her at 14 months old. She's now a couple years old and has been adopted. And this is that 395 gram baby I showed you earlier. And this is her with her twin. And, and what's happening with time is we're having more and more of the twins. Um, survive. So that's the end of the talk, and I can try to answer as many questions as I think we can try to answer. Thank you.